Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to INET's webinar, A Global Perspective on the COVID-19 Pandemic. Our speaker today, Nobel Prize winning economist Michael Spence, is in a particularly good position to speak to the topic at hand. He's been studying the Chinese economy closely, along with other developing countries, for many years, and is also an expert on the economics of innovation and technology, which of course is playing a central role in the response to the crisis. Mike has been closely involved with INET's work for a long time now, and along with Joe Stiglitz, chairs our Commission on Global Economic Transformation. He is Professor of Economics at the NYU Stern School of Business and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He has served as chairman of the Independent Commission on Growth and Development and is the author of the book, The Next Convergence, The Future of Economic Growth in a Multi-Speed World. As countries around the world slowly prepare to reopen their economies, Mike will be speaking to us about strategies for reopening the global economy that balance the health and economic risks of the virus and are most effective for the restoration of economic activity. So before a word or two about the structure of the webinar, INET's president, Rob Johnson, will start us off with a few words, and then Mike will present for about 40 minutes, and we can open it up for questions. At the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. You can type in your questions there, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the time that we have. So, Rob? A few words about our speaker. Uh, Mike Spence has won a Nobel Prize. I'm sure you're older than I am, and I'm 63. <laughs> and every time I meet with this man, I feel like I'm with a kid. His energy level, his curiosity. You know, I'm walking my dog in the morning, and I get a phone. We got to study the geo network of mobile phones <laughs> and what it implies for data in India. Yeah. And then... The next thing I know, I'm reading about the Luhan Academy and African development, and I'm finding him almost acting like a political scientist in the Project Syndicate, his recent article with uh, a co-author, uh, Mr. Brady, David Brady, on the trust deficit in governance. And I feel like I'm supposed to be this guy in the vanguard of economic thinking, and I'm getting out of breath just chasing down the tracks, redefining the agenda every time I talk to Mike. So I, you're a tremendous resource to the world, to INET, to our mission. And the thing that people probably don't get to experience as much as I do is that with that curiosity and with that kind of ever ready bunny energy level is a humility and an open mindedness and a constructive mind frame that is very, very effective and attractive to work with. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Thanks, Rob. That's very nice of you. So is it over to me? It is. Well, okay. And I'm going to try to share my screen. So I have a few um, uh, slides I have. Uh, I hope I've got the right ones here. And uh, then I have to push a button that says, there, how's that look? Does that look okay? All right. Um, so I really appreciate the kind introduction and I've, I've really just learned so much from my association with Rob and with INET. Uh, they're doing wonderful work and trying to, you know, help us break out of the sort of conventional thinking traps that we are, we're all vulnerable to. And, uh, and I could go on about that a great lot. But what my topic today is I'm, I'm going to try to share some recent work that my friends in, in China, specifically in Hangzhou, have done to try to help us understand the, the what I call the tracking and navigating of the, of the pandemic economy. So I'll, I'll, there are a lot of slides here. I, I think they'll be made available after for those of you who are interested. So there's a lot of you know, debate about what, this, what the economy will look like in the course of this, but I think there's an emerging consensus, which is we, we are going to go through um, in varying ways, and, and it varies a lot from country to country, a set of stages, but the, the, the overall pattern looks like this. There's a period 
the shorter the better in which the virus starts to spread. Uh, and in this case, I think with, the, with only a few exceptions, that, that occurred sort of invisibly or semi-invisibly, which meant that the reaction time was um, slow. <clears throat> and when the reaction came, it had to be pretty violent to stop uh, a, an explosive spread of the virus. So you get a precipitous drop, as you can see in this slide, into a valley. Um, and then you have to stay in that valley in one form or another uh, for a while while the virus, you know, and the time lags associated with it, you know, sort of uh, loses steam. And then you can start the process that most of us are experiencing now, which is a sort of gradual, sequenced, careful opening up. Uh, and at some point, and so you'll get a, a pattern that looks like what I put on the right hand side of the slide, we think. Um, some people try to describe this using the letters of the alphabet. Um, so a V seems unlikely, uh, bumps along the way are, are quite likely, uh, and, you know, outbursts that have to be dealt with. So, we'll, you know, Ws, I, I think, are meant to capture that idea. I think the, the main thing to, I wanted to communicate with this slide is that the process is slow, and there is only a certain amount you can do to to accelerate it. So you can, I think most of us understand, at least intuitively, that the economic and human costs of the virus are very high, but the, but the economic and human costs of locking down an economy for a very long period of time are not only high, but they get bigger and bigger as time goes on. And so you can't do it forever. So at some point, you know, whether the trade-off looks benign or not so benign, depending on where you are, you, you, you've got to enter this last process and 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 so even if you unlock the economy uh there's a, there's going to be risk and risk aversion on the part of the participants in the economy and that will slow down the the recovery that little green line is uh the only thing that'll sort of change this picture from my point of view dramatically would be a vaccine and everybody knows that then you'd get something that looks a little bit more like an actual you um <clears throat> So if, if, I, if I were going to sort of try to describe this very briefly, uh, uh, I would say um, first order of business when we, when, we, when we locked down the economy is that we took a tremendous hit. The estimates are highly variable because there are lags in the arrival of the data. But in the U.S. case, I wouldn't be surprised if on a sort of one quarter or part, at least part of a quarter basis, the, the, the magnitude of the negative shock would be on the order of 25 to 30% of GDP. <clears throat> now that won't show up in the annual data because you know we'll start to go up afterwards. Uh, at the macro level, the mon I, I think the response has been pretty good, at least in theory. The monetary policy people stepped into the breach and reversed course in the case of the US and, 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 and went back to the highly aggressive and accommodated monetary policy. And I think the main purpose of that was to create or ensure you had fiscal space. Um, and that fiscal space has then been used in the form of very large programs. And those programs are designed to make sure the medical system has the appropriate capacity to buffer the shock for individuals who have lost jobs and income <laughs> and have continuing expenses um, to try to prevent unnecessary loss of businesses, bankruptcies, um, and to some extent, and this is a work in progress, to redistribute uh, the balance sheet damage that results from this shock. I think it's important to say this is, we're not going to get this back. Uh, you know, we're going to lose something. Uh, we may not know its magnitude, but it's permanently gone. We may get back eventually in X quarters where people differ on what X is, but it's not, we're not gonna get back what we lost on the way through. If you, if uh, I look recently with some, a couple of friends at the US economy, it, the 2019 GDP uh, in nominal terms of the US economy was about $21.4 trillion. So a quarter would come out at about 5.3. If you lose 25 to 30% of that, you lose a, on the order of $1.3 trillion right then. <clears throat> if you take seven quarters to recover, uh, you'll lose when, and then add up all of that before you get back to kind of quote normal, the post pandemic period, then, then the damages will be on the order of 6.4 to roughly half, 10 
or $11 trillion. These are very rough numbers, but it gives you the order of magnitude of what we probably are facing. The distributional impacts of this um, virus are, are, uh, are sig really significant. Um, I, I've written something recently in which I characterize the pandemic economy as an unequal opportunity unemployer. Uh, and <laughs> sort of play on words, unequal opportunity employer. But the unemployment rate right now is probably about 25%. 39% of the households with income below $40,000, according to a recent Fed study, um, are uh, you know uh, unemployed, uh, which means without a job, furloughed, some of them furloughed, but collecting unemployment insurance. <laughs> a study by a couple of um, faculty members at the University of Chicago uh, so a more than a month ago, uh, looked at the question, how many jobs can be done at home? Uh, and they, um, and, and I've given the reference down here at the bottom, they're at the Fried Friedman uh, Becker Institute at the University of Chicago. And what you see here is that there's fairly significant differences uh, across uh, counties, basically, or, you know, localities. So in San Jose, call it Silicon Valley, you know, you get an unweighted uh, uh, number of 0.51 of those jobs can be done remotely and all the way down to, you know, ones that basically are doing labor intensive stuff. Um, Cape Coral, Florida is at the bottom at 0.28. If you look at this from the point of view of, of sectors, uh, then, <coughs> what, then you get a picture that looks like this. Again, this is, you know, too hard to read, but if you look on the right hand side at the, at the or left hand side at the bottom, you see um, accommodation and food service. This is an, uh, it's called hospitality. This is 16.7 million people in the workforce of the United States. And there, the fraction of jobs that can be done remotely is 0 0.04. These weighted by wage numbers are always bigger because it's always the slightly the higher income jobs that are doable remotely rather than the other. So the bottom line is th this shock is much larger in in terms of the impact it has on incomes and uh, and uh, assets and economic security at the lower end of the spectrum, which is why the redistribution part is so important. Um, shifting over to the sort of uh, to the uh, uh, health side of this, uh, this is a graph my friends from uh, Hangzhou gave me. I think it's well known, uh, and that is in with a very few exceptions, testing ability is well below ideal, uh, pretty much across the board, but there are big differences between high, middle, and low income countries on the average. And I'll come back and talk at the end about the, the, the lower, middle, and lower income countries uh, in the context of the sort of tracking uh, things I wanna talk about. Um, what's going on here, this graph is kind of colorful, but it, all it really says, these are shares of the um, total confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases globally. Um, so in, uh, at the start, it was essentially almost all East Asia. Um, and then the Middle East and North Africa chimed in and then Western Europe came and then, uh, and so on North America is this light blue line in kind of in the light blue area in the middle. Uh, and so, and of course, what you're seeing if this graph kind of goes on um, it's this one stopped in uh, early March, but th this this these red things up at the right hand corner are getting bigger um, as a fraction as the virus spreads into the developing world. Um, the fundamentals, as I see it, the, and I won't spend a lot of time on this. There's been a lot written uh, about this, um, but the fundamentals of the a pandemic economy, with just a way to say this is an unusual economy. Um, seem to me the following. First of all, you know, there is risk associated with ordinary everyday activity, and that risk is more or less proportional to the prevalence of the, of the virus in the population. Um, in response to that risk, you have two things going on. One is mobility, uh, business shutdowns, and se even whole sector shutdowns, um, are, are undertaken as policy matters and that, and that is sort, of, sort of simultaneously removes demand and supply. And then, and then the fact that, you know, unlike normal times when you go out to do various things, especially ones that involve contact with other people, 
there are risks and and when the virus is uh, out of control, those risks are fairly high and people simply won't do them. So risk aversion plays a significant role in this. And so I think the way <clears throat> both to deal with the health thing, but also to deal with the economy is to focus on the risk side. Um, and reducing risk, you know, has at least three dimensions. One is reducing the probability of infection per contact, per contact, pair, pairwise contact. Um, and that's what we are, are doing with our, uh, what are normally called social distancing for reasons I don't really understand, because um, it's physical distancing. The second one is you wanna reduce the number of, con for, for any given level of economic activity, you wanna reduce the number of contacts that are needed to carry that out. So that means that things that where you get, it's basically a bang for the buck argument. So. So the things that are the, the most dangerous and where you get the worst ratio of risk in, re, in, in, in relation to, you know, sort of benefit from an economic or, you know, enjoyment point of view are very large gatherings. So, so you've got sports events that, you know, are canceled. Schools are a major, major issue. Universities are pretty much, for the most part, shut down at least until the fall and so on. And the final one, which is the, the, important, the really important one, is you want to reduce the prevalence among uh, people in circulation. And that is where this business of testing at a very large scale, um, tracking, isolating the people who test positive, doing it again, uh, and, and, and some digital technology. So just to stay on that for a minute, test, testing means testing and, and getting the results very quickly. The, 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 the characteristics of this virus are that if you test somebody and, get the, and then get the result a week later, they'll have been, and, and it turns out to be positive, and they're then isolated, about 45% by the estimates of a lot of epidemiologists of their, whatever spreading they're going to do will have already occurred. Um, so you don't, you don't want to do that. Uh, and the second thing is, I don't know in the end what use of digital technology we are, we are going to make use of, excuse me, I'm going to shut off a phone here. Um, uh, but we, at the moment, are for privacy and suspicion of government and other reasons are not doing much in the area of, uh, of using digital technology to help us. I understand that, I, I, I don't quarrel with it, but, it, but there are tools there that have in, in some places been pretty useful. Um, I'm not gonna try to change anybody's mind, but maybe a story. I was talking with a very good friend in Hangzhou who was part of the process of uh, enabling the creation of this, what's called a mo mobile uh, you know, health code. It's a QR code, which is color coded green if you, the, the system, the AI system deems you to be low risk. Um, so I asked him how things are going and he, I, and he said, well, we're going out to restaurants and we're eating, we're normal and they're taking our temperatures. And the, and, but the main thing is we all have these QR codes and, they're, and if you're out and around, they have to be green. Uh, and, and that means that we have the perception, and it's probably the reality, that the prevalence in the population that's actually circulating is uh, well below the prevalence in the, in the overall economy because the people who are infectious have been taken out. Um, so the, hard, the bottom line is the hard part of this is managing risk and, and getting demand back up. Uh, so, there are lots of anecdotal versions of this. I think it'll be a long, long time before, you know, air travel, especially international air travel, you know, comes back. Now I'm going to now uh, the last, you know, half of what I want to talk about is this attempt by uh, uh, colleagues at the Luan Academy um, to try to track the um, pandemic, the economy in the midst of a pandemic, and the policies that are a response to it, and so on. Um, and, and the, so here's a, here's a challenge. You can track the economy, you know, by plotting over time, by plotting measures of economic performance on the vertical axis against time on the, on the other axis, but then, you know, the health side's missing. Or you can plot, plot you know, things that capture the, you know, the pandemic side against time, um, but then you've got the economic side missing. Um, and at least in the case of economic data, they tend to come with a lag. 
So the bottom line is you sort of really don't know what's going on. Um, what these folks have done is try to find a way uh, to track them both at the same time. Uh, and so the graphs that I'm going to describe now do come from Luan Academy. They're, they're planning to make next week to make this live and invite um, anybody who's interested, scholars, researchers, not only to come and take a look at it, but to contribute to the effort um, to try to do this better and better as time goes on. So I think of this as a work in progress. Um, and it's based on mobility data. Uh, so the mobility data, a lot of mobility data, which many of you have seen, comes from Google. It's extraordinarily detailed. Um, for the United States, you can get daily mobility data uh, by type of activity for the United States by state and county. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, and so in that sense, we are using the digital technologies to at least help provide an, a, a kind of tracking of what's going on in the economy. Um, so these graphs I'm going to show you, um, and I apologize, this thing sort of overlaps. They sort of look like this. And so I'm going to describe what's on them and then take a look at some of the graphs with you um, to see how we're doing. So on the vertical axis is, a, is a, an estimate of the economic contraction uh, in the economy. And it is an estimate that is based on daily mobility data. Um, and the reason they've used daily mobility data is they ran some regressions and discovered that something like 75% of the variation in economic performance in the, in the first quarter across countries and regions within countries, uh, you know, was explainable by changes in mobility in the population. So it's an imperfect estimate for sure. It doesn't capture everything, uh, but it's uh, an attempt to capture the economic side of things. On the horizontal axis, instead of time, uh, you have something that looks like time, it says days. And what this is, is it's a proxy for how, um, how rapidly the uh, virus is spreading. So I apologize for this, but I'm just going to have to tell you what it is. Um, basically, <coughs> at any point of time, any particular day, you go back in time and ask, when was the most recent previous occasion when the virus, the confirmed cases of the virus, and we know that's an inaccurate number capturing actual cases, but any case, that's the number we have. You go back and find the, 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 how many days it took from that previous occasion for the, for the virus count to double, right? So the longer that number is, bigger that number is, the slower the virus is spreading, right? So, so going right on this graph is good, right? Because if you get over here to the right side, you see the number 80, uh, you'll see it more clearly on the next graphs. Um, that means that, that on this graph, it was 80 days, it took 80 days for the virus to get to uh, the, the count that it is associated with that particular day. Um, so that's the attempt to put, so this is a three-dimensional thing. It's uh, economy, vi you know, health or virus or some version of that, and time, and that, so, but if you plot it three-dimensionally, it's very hard to see. So the attempt, so basically the way to think of this is you've got economy and virus on the two axes and time is moving as you go along one of these curves. Hope that's clear. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna look at these waves of the virus. So. So this is, these are fairly typical patterns. And, and so you see both what the pattern looks like and what the, um, and, and, and the variation. So um, the, the line at the bottom is China. So China, uh, like everybody else, you know, had a, uh, missed the start, lost the opportunity for early containment. It got out of control, especially in Wuhan. Um, and then they, um, then they reacted with the huge aggression, locking, essentially locking down Wuhan and a great deal of the rest of the economy. <clears throat> and what you see on these lines are days. Now, I, it, we're going to have to fix this graph. So there are two days at the, at, after you've fallen off the cliff here. One is um, 30 days, uh, and that's the date when you hit the bottom. On most of these graphs, you'll see a day, another day a little bit further to the right where you actually start, you know, the economy starts recovering, meaning the contraction is smaller, right? So they drop down to 80% by this estimate using mobility data. 
um, the, the recovery started fairly quickly, which is why these numbers overlap, and it's 31 days. And then they, and then they go through this shaded area. The shaded area is 10 to 20 days. And it's a, it's a, it's, um, it comes from uh, the following. If, if you look at all of these cases and ask a, a wide range of cases and ask, when was the first time you got three consecutive days, three consecutive days in which the new cases were exceeded by the recoveries, meaning people who recovered from the virus, didn't die, had it, and are known to have recovered. So, so that means that, that the total number of active cases in the economy is going down. Uh, that number looked at, looked at over a wide range of, of, of countries was in the 10 to 20 day range. And so that's the shaded area. In other words, somewhere in there, you're getting control of the virus, right? Because you're, you've essentially peaked in terms of total cases out there. Uh, and, and the recoveries are starting to beat uh, the, 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 the spread of the virus. So you can see the China case. So they, they um, started up, they got through that reasonably promptly, and they're by far the furthest into this from anybody because they started this in January. There's no start dates on this, but there's a, there are differential start dates um, for these economies. Now, if you look at the red line, that's Hong Kong sitting beside, uh, sitting beside China. Now, the Hong Kong economy has been hit very hard because it's very dependent on international travel and tourists, and especially uh, people, shoppers from the mainland, and all of that went away. So that's not good. Um, but this is in a case where they got on it really quickly, had a less sharp drop, uh, a reasonably rapid um, transition through this so-called, you know, um, getting out of danger zone and, um, and over and narrowed at 50 days. Um, and you can see the Korea case, which is much talked about where the, dr the drop is less significant. Um, then they proceeded along, they were in recovery, you know, early on at 21 days. They're now 85 days into this. They've had some setbacks that you can see over on the right-hand side of that, of that graph. So, so the difference between these things basically is, is the, speed of, of the speed and effectiveness of the early response um, that, that, that occurred. Everything after that is probably somewhat similar. You just get a bigger economic hit if you're slow. Um, this is the second wave. So this is Europe. Um, and we're sort of not doing so well. I, I was going to say at the start, if, if we'd had this uh, get together uh, a couple of months ago, I would have been interrupted by an ambulance that you would have heard through my slightly thin windows approximately every three minutes. Uh, it was a tough time. So that's Italy, where I am. That's the light blue line. And you can see this is a tremendous drop and then a very long transition um, way down under, you know, with a, more than an 80% contraction and 62 days until um, then we started to see uh, the sort of economic recovery um, show up. So, th so the economic hit is going to be enormous. And maybe this is the right time to say, you, you, you can't see everything on every graph, but the longer you are you stay in a large contraction like this, the larger the damage you're gonna to have to deal with later on. Wherever it shows up, it may show up in you know, problems with business survival. Uh, it may show up in you know, uh, people having to go to food banks to stay alive. It, it, a lot of it is gonna show up in the sovereign debt side because a fair amount of the economic policy response is moving balance sheet damage or potential balance sheet damage to the government side. And so in the case of Italy, we're going to go from a not very uh, healthy sovereign debt to GDP ratio of 135% to at least probably 160%, which, is, which means that when we come out of this, whatever the other dimensions of it are, we're, go we're going to have an economy that's very heavily indebted and has at least some significant, even with relaxed monetary, uh, accommodative monetary policy, some real constraints on what the public sector can afford to do. Um, you see the USA, uh, it, we're, uh, it's this kind of blue line in the, in the middle. 
we started later. Um, our drop has been less significant. Uh, it's probably because the economy is more resilient. Um, so we, get, we basically dropped for 16 days once we locked the thing down. Uh, and then we've kind of wandered along through this thing and we're out at about um, 61 days. Great Britain, which is the red line, has been hit harder. Um, that drop was on the order of 80% and their uh, pattern, you know, kind of along the bottom is similar, but so far, uh, at least according to these ways of trying to get at the thing, we're not really um, going very fast in terms of recovery. Uh, and you can see the other ones. I don't want to spend time describing each one, but you can, you can, once you sort of get some practice reading these things, you get a fairly good picture of what's going on in specific economies and, and how they compare to each other. Um, this one, I think I won't spend a lot of time on. Um, you know, France is the, is the slight blue line right at the bottom. So they're having a, an experience that's not wildly different so far from Italy. Um, and in, in terms of their 63 days into it, having hit bottom after 16 days of sort of shutting the place down. Um, and uh, the German case, which is this blue line in the dark blue line in the middle, um, that's, a, that's an interesting case. So they, they have much bigger testing capacity um, and move much more aggressively on that side and minimize the draconianness of the trade off between economic activity on the one hand and, um, and opening the economy back up. But even then, um, it took them a while to get, um, you know, get the thing under control. They were at 30 days um, when they got into that shaded zone and then it dropped again and they had to react to that. Uh, but they're probably uh, gonna come out of this. I would say the German economy is probably at this point in the process of turning up and that will show, show up in subsequent data. It, by the way, the intention, as in the Google case, is to update these things daily uh, so that they're accessible and, and, and to update them for essentially every country in the world. There'll be, there'll be some data problems for certain countries. This is the third wave. Um, and I'm gonna spend a little time on this, you know, and I'll, and I'll finish up here. I hope people have a sense of what's going on in this graph. So, so <clears throat> the, dark, the light blue line uh, that sort of squiggles around that starts over here on the left hand side is India. So India uh, experienced the virus later. Um, it spread very rapidly as is the case in most of the countries of the world. A very, um, uh, given the density of the country, you know, a very significant sort of aggressive uh, locking down of the economy causing an economic drop or an estimated uh, contraction on the order of more than 20%, down to under 80%. Um, but then this is what you don't want to see. So, and this is why the days matter. So that occurred after 20 days. And what's happened in the, in the interim is that the Indian economy has essentially, you know, stayed down, not made a huge amount of progress in moving to the right, which is improving the health outcomes and 60 days later is still toward the left-hand side of this zone um, where you're at the margin starting to get control of the virus. Um, and you see a similar thing for Pakistan, which is the green line. So this is, this is, uh, this is what happens when um, it's very difficult to contain the spread of the virus because of you know, the density of the population in places like Mumbai. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I don't, this is not meant to be critical at all, but this, this you know, means that you've basically uh, continued to experience over an extended period of time, more than two months, significant economic damage without getting the benefit of a significant improvement in the rate of reduction of the spread of, of the virus as measured by this you know, days to double measure on the horizontal axis. Um, on the other hand, Vietnam, which is much talked about, uh, is, is the red line here. Uh, and it, uh, this, this thing at the top to the left is, you know, what's happening. <laughs> so nothing's happening in the economy, but the virus is spreading and the days of doubling is getting larger and eventually they respond. And when they respond, then you get the drop. It's less precipitous and it's less deep. 
that occurs at 23 days. And then at 26 days, uh, then you start up and they're 65 days into that with a significant, um, a significant improvement on, sorry, uh, significant improvement in both the economy or, or this measure of it. I keep saying this measure of it because I don't want you to, this is not a GDP number and we won't have a GDP number for, you know, a while. Uh, so hopefully this isn't misleading, but it looks like this is a, a reasonably successful case of simultaneously getting the virus under control and, uh, and, uh, and getting the economy back up and running to some extent. Um, and here is, so the America, so here unfortunately, you see a pattern that is somewhat similar to what we saw in some of the, um, the cases um, for South Asia. And I didn't focus on Pakistan, but it, it has a, si a similar problem. So here, for example, uh, the light blue line is Brazil. Now the, the drop is not that significant, perhaps because you know, the lockdown things are, are less um, aggressive, um, but they're 68 days into this and they're not going much of anywhere economically and, and, and they're not going much of anywhere um, in terms of changing the rate of spread of the virus. So th again, this, this, is, this is the thing, this is the pattern I wanted to draw your attention to, but this is what you don't wanna have happen. Um, because then, then you bet, get a, a very long period uh, in which people are suffering, the economy is suffering, and you're not getting a kind of grip on the virus. Um, the red line is Peru, so that's a similar pattern. Um, again, I'm not being critical. Uh, you know, the toolkit for many of these economies um, is at least less powerful um, than the toolkit that's available for richer countries, you know. Uh, on the other hand, Bra Brazil is a, you know, a middle to high middle income country. So in principle, uh, it, it should be possible to sort of improve on this performance. Some of the poorer countries, I think, don't have much fiscal space, uh, probably have trouble with the medical capacity to deal with the, with the um, potential overwhelming of the medical system and so on. Uh, and this is, uh, these are African countries. Um, Rwanda has, is talked about, you know, for those of, you, of us who read about the experience of the virus around a number of countries. Um, it looks bad on this graph, uh, but, but actually it's not too bad. They had a fairly long lockdown. They had a lockdown that produced a big drop. And then they, and they, whatever these policies were, and they maintained it you know, for another 27 days to 40, and then they had a relapse, um, but they made significant progress in, um, in containing the, the virus spread, uh, moving over here to the kind of, to the right of the shaded area. Now, you know, it could be better, but it's, that's, uh, uh, Kenya, uh, less significant drop. Um, you, you, I think you start to get to see what, what the problem here in these economies is the first response produces the contraction of varying magnitudes. And then there's an attempt, to, you know, to pay the price and get the virus under control. And yet the problem is the price is being paid in terms of the, the continuation of the contraction without getting the kind of benefits we saw in the earlier graphs and moving well to the right in terms of uh, days of, to double, which is the, the in, in this uh, way of thinking about it is the, is the, is the uh, kind of summary measure of how you're doing on, on the virus thing. Um, so, so, that, so I think this is, a, you know, a, it's a work in progress. It's a useful technology. I find it extremely helpful um, because, it, because it does at least try to address uh, the question of, uh, well, first of all, it's comprehensive with respect to uh, the countries in the world. It's updated daily, so you you know you're not get, you're not reading about something that happened you know a month and a half ago or something like that. This is you know for, for whatever its sort of approximations are, it's it is you know in real time essentially, and it does try to capture the sort of simultaneous movement in the two dimensions we really care about, which is how's the economy doing and how are we doing in getting the uh, in the virus virus under control. 
and and I think, you know, if you sort of average across all the things we've seen, while well, there's considerable variation, you can see why, um, why the forecasts that we're going to have a relatively difficult and slow recovery um, are probably, it, it reinforces um, that conclusion. So I would say, I don't know how you want to describe that, but sharp drop followed by a difficult and somewhat bumpy recovery um, with a with with lingering with a lingering set of headwinds that have to do with the really difficult sectors, right? Like air travel, um, international travel, uh, and so on. So that, that, that's where we are. Um, I think it's a, a useful technology, and for those of you who are interested, it'll be really quite widely available. I think in about a week. So that's I think enough from me for now. Can I? Turn it back over to Rob and Pia. Thank you, Mike. Um, that is a really remarkable um, data set that you have there. And it's really important for us to try and understand what's happening in all of these different countries. Um, it was disturbing for me in particular to see the numbers for India. Um, they shut down the economy quite aggressively. We've heard a fair amount about how authoritarian countries like China have had the ability to do more by way of shutting down their economy and controlling the thing. India was pretty aggressive and it came at a significant cost because so much of the population is informal workers. And so you literally have people starving in India because they can't work. So you're looking at the trade-off in very stark terms there. But now you've looked at this range of different um, responses and the impacts of it. Do you have any takeaways in terms of what this is telling us about what governments could have done, should have been doing, and how we should be thinking about this moving forward? Yes, I do. I mean, so I think, you know, you can divide this sort of into a, a fairly small number of subsets. Um, one a small subset of cases is ones where they saw it coming and reacted quickly enough to essentially either contain or partially contain in a significant way uh, the the virus at the start, which meant that whatever steps they had to take, the the economic contraction was less and the recovery process less difficult because because at the start, if you contain it early enough, you can do it, you know, with testing, tracking, screening, isolating, and so on, with or without the digital technology support. Um, and then you don't have to do a kind of full lockdown. And that's kind of what happened in Hong Kong and a number of places. So that's a subset. But the vast majority of cases are ones where, um, for understandable reasons, but you know, a bit, but, you know, two years from now when historians get at this there will be lots of time to criticize the reactions and so on but they were slow there's no question um pretty much everywhere which means that your own you lose the capacity to contain the virus in the ordinary sense that the epidemiologists mean and then then you have the lockdowns which is an attempt to essentially avert a disaster and you have the economic consequences of that which become become more severe the the lower the income and wealth of the economy, for sure. Uh, and they become more severe, the less aggressive the government is in trying to protect people from the damage that occurs. So both of those factors, I think, are the driving characteristics. One thing I didn't say is that even for the countries that can afford, you know, very large pro fiscal programs. Uh, I mean, my friend Mohammed Larian says that the American fiscal program is three trillion on the fiscal side and another estimated three trillion coming from the monetary side. So at six trillion is a pretty big number. It's like a quarter, more than a quarter of GDP. And still, you know, you have the following sort of conditions. You have a number of states where nobody could file their unemployment claim because the system went down right? You just couldn't get through. Or people tell me there's lots of places where, you know, there's people lined up literally almost for miles at food banks trying to get food. So, so implementation really matters. Speed and implementation. And I think, you know, when we have time and go back and look, we'll discover that in those dimensions, probably there's some things to fix. Um, so we're better prepared for the next time. But, you know, in India and Mumbai, you know, with a, 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 an informal workforce, you know, some of whom are trying to walk 100 miles to, or, you know, more 
um, to get home. This is, it's hard to know exactly um, how you'd go about sort of protecting everybody um, given the resources available um, to the economy. And in general, in developing countries, this varies a lot, you know, from one to the next, the middle income countries, which India is, still has a lot of poor people. You know, they don't have as much fiscal space. The medical system is, um, has lower capacity to deal with the surge, the peak load problem, and so on. So I think we're, we're gonna, uh, we're either gonna see a massive amount of international help um, coming through to try to mitigate some of this pain and suffering, or it will just occur. I, 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 it's hard to sidestep that conclusion. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn now to the questions that we have that have come in. I have a question here from Robert Owen. Uh, the discussion remains at a rather aggregate level. How important is an understanding of micro adjustment processes for defining hysteresis effects and path dependency, thereby defining likely recovery scenarios? Well, you're right. These are kind of aggregate data. Um, you, in principle, you can do this. Uh, because of, at least for where the places where the Google data is, um, because you have um, you have county level recording reporting on uh, in many countries county or the equivalent uh, reporting on health, um, the virus you know confirmed cases and so on, um, and you have um, this location data for that, so you can do a much better job of parsing. Um, now, an issue we didn't talk about is that once you get to a very local level then the, at least on the virus side, um, the, the issue of whether people are moving across borders matters a lot, right? I mean, it mattered at the start because that's how we transmitted it. Um, so, so I think we can, you know, we can, we can dig pretty, pretty deeply on, on that front and there's no question there's variation. So, and that, that is showing up in people's, people are, a significant number of people want to sort of start opening up and you know and if you tell them it's dangerous they you know they essentially it's not that they don't care it's that they think the cost of staying in this lockdown condition and that's more pronounced yeah. that pressure that is more pronounced in places where the virus has been um less prevalent yeah so apropos of that, there's another question that's come in about Sweden. It says, does the data drop, does your data show the longer the lockdown, the bigger the drop? And how does this explain what's going on in Sweden? Um, in, so Sweden has been widely discussed as sort of having an unconventional policy. Basically, um, you know, the hit has been, as I remember, the hit, the contraction has been less in Sweden because the lockdowns have been less um, dramatic. Um, so more of the economy is functioning. Um, they've had their ups and downs in terms of uh, the spread of the virus. So at some point it looked like it was fairly under control and then they had some spreading. And, that, and given the approach they took, which is to uh, basically trust people to behave well, um, you know, follow the social distancing guidelines, don't do, you know, crazy risky things and so on. Um, but they still had some you know, uh, some bumps along the road. I, I would say the Swedish case is, uh, is instructive because it's a much less dramatic lockdown than in many other countries. Um, and it's like kind of a qualified success and very interesting because it's different from the others. Right, oh, here we go. Okay, so. Yes, the yellow. Second wave, Europe. So, so Sweden's the yellow line, yeah. So a contraction of just over 10%. Um, and, you know, I think that, that so, so if you wanted to make that, to say something negative about that, you would say, you would, you would like to have that yellow line be further to the right, okay? Uh, now, Sweden's a small open economy and international trade has suffered enormously because their trading partners have been either inaccessible or shut down. So there's a limited amount of recovery Sweden can do on their own, period, right? I mean, just the way it is. All, all you know, highly efficient, competitive, small economies like that are, are specialized and therefore dependent on, uh, de dependent more than say China or the United States on the, the state of the global economy. 
Um, but I would say, you know, what the qualification of the success here is they're 66 days in, according to this thing, and they're, 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 they've got the virus coming down, but it would be nice to see that days to doubling number be, uh, be, uh, be a, bigger, uh, a bigger number. And you can see at least one significant bump they experienced there uh, when they had to kind of tighten, tighten it up. Right. Uh, okay, I have a question here from Doug Carmichael. Uh, COVID is the entrance into climate issues. What are the implications for how we handle the economy now and the next few months? Back to normal makes climate more difficult. No, well, it's absolutely true. No, I think, I mean, <laughs> so, so the improvement in the um, environment, including the climate dimension that is associated with the response to this virus is, you know, on a reasonably short list, one of the great kind of big pluses. And I think people, you know, who care about that issue, and it's a very large number of people are starting to think, you know, well, maybe uh, the experience of the pandemic economy will, give, will bring lessons that allow us to deal more effectively um, with the climate change thing. And I, I, and I actually think that, I mean, I don't know how that's gonna play out. I and, and many others have tried to sort of think a little bit about what the post pandemic economy will look like and in what respects um, it will be different. And, and I can easily imagine a, a post pandemic economy um, that is much, much more favorable um, to the, to the uh, climate issue, to carbon emissions, for example. Um, so people may travel less. I think, you know, it's reasonable to expect in multiple areas, hybrid models of work where it's possible. I, I don't think you'll see a wholesale switch. I mean, people really get tired of staring at a screen at home. And so do kids. It's really hard on them. <laughs> Uh, but hybrid models, you know, where, you know, some number of days a week, you're not um, in your car and something like that. But it's a little early to kind of be sure, you know, I mean, one of the things people talk about is that maybe people won't want to live in big cities and they'll go out and live in more spread out areas, big concentrated cities and go out and live in, you know, more spread out areas. I mean, this is very country specific. I mean, you can't do that in India. Uh, right. But, but, you know, that would actually make it worse. Um, bottom line is I'm kind of got my fingers crossed and it's hopeful and it's certainly nice to see a clear skies and b measurements of uh, carbon emissions go down, even though it's a terrible way to achieve it. Yeah, well, we certainly see clearer skies in LA, which I've been appreciating. Yeah. We have a question here from another one of our commissioners, Mohammed El Arian says, yeah. great presentation, Mike. And the question is, to the extent that the policy space slash flexibility is limited in some of the developing world, how should we best think about the macro trade-offs, exchange rate overshoots, reserve depletion, debt payments, et cetera? So I think we should, we should um, I, I think this is underway, Mohammed, but I, mean, I should, if, if, full disclosure, Mohammed and I talk about these things offline all the time, not online, but offline if you see what I mean. Um, so, and, and um, I, I'm tempted to ask him the same question because he <laughs> has thought a lot about this. So my take on this is for the places that have less fiscal space, we should encourage them, you know, have a special financing arrangements and expand that fiscal space and be prepared essentially to, um, to restructure the debt as needed. They just absolutely need this if we want to avoid a, um, not an economic catastrophe so much, but a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, so that's one thing. But you know, the honest truth is, is, second, for the countries that are in the early stages, you know, a massive amount of support to, to try to do the containment uh, option strikes me as, uh, as, uh, as promising. Now, whether you can pull it off and whatnot, that'll take external help. I mean, there's a bunch of organizations in the world um, you know, like the Gates Foundation that, you know, has a lot of experience in doing this and they're active and out there and so on. Um, so I think you could, you could do that. I think help with medical capacity um, is, would be very helpful. So in, there's a whole bunch of dimensions in dealing with the health side and the fiscal side that I think would be helpful. But I guess if I'm being honest, uh, 
I, I, it's hard for me to see that, you know, something that's really effective um, coming down the pike other than the vaccine. A vaccine will stop this uh, if it's globally available. And so we've all got our fingers crossed that that'll happen sooner rather than later, but, but we have to deal with the interim in the middle. If, if they could turn your mic on, I'd love to hear your answer. To that, and I'm sure everybody else would love to hear your answer to that question too. So, um, Mohammed, if you can just unmute yourself, I've made it possible for you to speak. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. I, I really didn't want to speak, and if I had an answer to the question, I wouldn't have asked Mike. Uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't. Sorry. I wouldn't have wasted his time and everybody else's time. I think the really important um, point from Mike's great presentation is in game theory. This is a multi-round game and the conditions change. So you have the first the lockdown phase, then you have the living with the virus phase, then you have the recovery from the virus phase. And risk aversion becomes very important um, in, in all three phases, which is a way of saying that in the first and second phase, um, debt, debt relief becomes really important, really, really important. Because the trade-off, um, involved are huge. In the first phase, it's about livelihoods. And in the second phase, it's about investments in, in, in health. These are not um, separate as I have, but this is really critical. Um, so I agree with you completely. The, the challenge is how to do it in an orderly fashion, especially on the private debt side. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, that really is a challenge. That's a good point, Mohammed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and all of these things, a general point related to Mohammed's last point, implementation is really, you know, I find relatively little fault with uh, given capacity with the, with the responses we've seen, other than a few cases of kind of obliviousness. I, but, the, but the real trick is, you know, kind of getting it done, right? Actually getting masks made uh, and testing, you know, available where it's needed and so on. Anyway. Back to you, Pia. Okay, thank you. We're actually out of time. So I want to uh, thank you for doing this with us, Mike. This was really interesting and a much deeper look at what's going on in the rest of the world than I think we've had before. Uh, so thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, it's you know obviously particularly timely as the US is talking about going back and many other countries are talking about going back. And the question is what kind of a recovery are we gonna have? So um, thank you. And thanks also to all of you who have tuned in from around the world. Um, thanks, Mohammed. sorry to put you on the spot like that. Uh, we are going to be having our next seminar, our next webinar next Friday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. And we're gonna be joined by Bruce Schneider, who's, uh, sorry, Bruce Schneier, who's a technology security expert, Kennedy School Fellow and board member for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And he's uh, gonna be talking specifically about one of the issues that came up today, which is what happens when you have digital contact tracing and what are the privacy issues around it? What are the trade-offs in terms of the health benefits and um, long-term impacts on our privacy? So I hope you will all join us for that. And thank you again. Thank you, Pia. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in.